to talk about the four quadrant fixation which i'm taking the reason i'm talking about four quadrant fixation is that the the, the simple fractures the regular your shaftsker type one two three four um split and split depression fractures are looked after and we sort of taking this to the next level um, classification shaftsker is the classic it's it, it provided us all the very early understanding of the mechanisms but this was an x-ray based early classification system it stood the test of time for many years and it has immensely helped us understanding these fractures but i think it's time to refine this um hole and mood classification has uh, tried to cover some fracture patterns that were not covered by the shaftsker uh and then came the three column classification and uh, they the three column classification looks at the posteromedial anteromedial and uh, so it, it basically ends up being four columns with the posterior side the whole posterior side is usually taken as one column and the anterior is divided into two uh realistically the you can take the posterior column as uh, the extension all the way to the fibula and then just the shaded area the one the part that's under the fibula from either side is is hard to access and the other three columns are relatively easy uh if you if you get the right approaches things that matter in fixing complex tibia plateau fractures where you think about these uh, surfaces is uh, getting articular congruency congruency the best you can and look after the articular comminution bone stock and void management see whether you're going to graft it allograft uh, or on substitutes these days are getting more and more popular i still like allograft um alignment is important and the way to check alignment would be to check column lengths now the one day we'll get navigation systems at the level of the arthroplasty surgeons and then we will be more sure about our alignments but right now the trauma surgeons are the are the poor uh, surgeons so we don't get all of those fancy toys and we get our alignment correction by radiological alignment sometimes uh, in in really bad cases you can use a diathermy cord from hip to ankle to get your alignment right but usually the column length and the metaphysical references is what helps with your alignment uh, assessment for example uh, the, this this is a neglected old case but you can see that displaced factors is that the posterior and medial part where the proximal articular part is split out and you can understand that the mechanics of this would be to push this back up uh, laterally as well as anteriorly and that would get your 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 medial side reduced um so when you plan these fractures in order to study the fracture you have to look at these things blocks to reduction what are what is going to block the reduction that's usually the tissue that's stuck inside <clears throat> the medial metaphysial fractures are going to have uh, by sensorinus stuck into them sometimes uh, they can be the ongoing displacing forces like the big attachment of the patellar tendon uh, and the tibial tuberosity will always want to lift up and uh, it turns into the, what we call the trochoid fracture uh, that's uh, uh, is mechanically very uh, demanding because the back of the tibia is being pulled posteriorly by your gastroceleus complex and the quadriceps mechanisms pulling the front the tuberosity away so it it mimics the reverse oblique fracture of the hip in its mechanical discrepancy about how the fracture is being pulled mechanically by in two different sides uh, two different sides <coughs> um in the your your split depression you will often find the, the lateral meniscus stuck in and you will have to make sure to release the lateral meniscus out of the fracture with your arthrotomy the common fallacies the problems that we see is people try to go percutaneous but if you don't get the fracture mechanics and the reduction right then the percutation percutaneous fixations will fail so if you need if if you need to rest the tissue you know put that put an xfix on leave it for weeks let it all settle but do the right operation rather than doing the wrong operation just to save time wrong mechanics wrong implants and wrong approach are all problems uh we get these two 
uh, somebody tried to do this really complex, complex fracture, high energy, small rim, and DBLT Bossy involved as well with percutaneous screws and obviously didn't work. Other common problem I see is using these list plates, which are the extra articular plates. They are off market in many countries now. I, I can't uh, find them unless I specifically order them anymore. But when you try to use these as tibia plateau plates, because these are not meant to be an articular fracture plate. These are meant to be metaphysical or shaft fracture plates back in the days. So uh, this plate is evil. Do not use that for tibia plateau fractures. Let's uh, get through some cases to make the points that I'm trying to uh, talk to you about. So this is dissociation. This is both sides and, and, and metaphysis. I won't talk in classification terms. I'll talk in the terms of what matters in this fracture. And as you can see on this medial side, there is a full dissociation of the metaphysis from there. And this is where you will invariably find the person setting us stuck inside the fracture. So a good medial approach is necessary. You might have to uh, pull the pass out and reconstruct it carefully uh, or just release the pass insertion in order to get the medial surface. Important thing is to not mess with the MCL because MCL is right in the base of the pass. Um, and when that is the case, when there is a metaphysical dissociation, the medial plates are the ones to use. This is the medial medial column plate where it sits right onto the medial side. As you can see directly on the medial side, that's where it's anatomically contoured for. If you place this plate to the posterior side of the tibia, it won't fit. Similarly, if you put the posterior medial plate on the medial or anteromedial side, it will force virus because these are anatomic uh, plates and they, you, you can't put them in a place where they're not meant to be without causing a secondary problem. Um, so the case that we had before, it required that direct medial plate and a lateral plate in order to get those column references and height references right. Then we go to the next part where the posteromedial surface comes into action. The, the way you make these decisions is, uh, I've done this MCL and the passing serenus. And you can see the apex of the fracture on your 3D CT scan. So now, I, I don't print these fractures as I said, uh, but to look at the 3D rendered CT scan is very important to me. It gives me an idea of the mechanics of the fracture or the displacing forces. Uh, that Just the slices sometimes can't, or it, it, it's more work to figure that out from this from the slices uh, and if you have a 3D reconstruction it's easier to understand that this fracture has an apex posteromedially so it needs a buttress from the posteromedial side. Now, if you try to do this fracture with the patient supine and trying to turn the leg out or make a figure of four you will be in pain because when you turn this into a figure of four the, the knee tries to start subluxing into varus and you, you your position is in a displacing force uh, mechanism. So you will be struggling against yourself trying to reduce this. So don't be afraid and uh, make sure to put the patient prone. Like you can see front of this tibia is completely pristine. You can't even find a fracture line there. And the apex of the fracture and a little bit of a communication corner is all posterior. Um, uh, more important but over here is that that articular fragment is stuck right inside there and because there is no girdy split you either have to do an open anterolateral approach and make an osteotomy but if you go posterior and elevate this apex you can get right underneath that fracture uh, so put your patient prone, use the Lobenhofer uh, approach, get the gastro medially and it's, it's, it's a, like it's very simple approach and as long as <clears throat> you keep under the uh, obliteus which is analogous to you know pronated quadratus for distal radius approach so the, I think of this like a distal radius approach um, and then you take the gastroc medial and the hamstring lateral sorry uh, gastroc lateral and the hamstrings medial and you get right to the joint um, another case where you can see this uh, articular fragment that's stuck in if you just go back and push the posterior cortex with a buttress plate trap the articular surface which has 
the uh, angle down so in order to <coughs> reduce that appropriately you will have to lift the posterior cortex before buttressing down the posterior corner so that's what it with this the patient is prone and we can a get from the apex of the fracture push the fracture up and put an put a containment plate so this is this is like a spring plate the one third tubular plate that's going obliquely laterally and you can with your fingers you can feel right up to the fibular head um and that oblique plate goes to buttress that very lateral posterior side of the fracture and then is sprung under the standard posterior lateral sorry posterior medial uh, tibia plate and then the lateral plate adds the additional value under or, or rafting screws under that uh, lateral combination and that's the final uh, post op reconstruction um and the posterior or lateral combination can get to different levels unlike the other guy that didn't have the gerdes uh, split this one has a very clear gerdes split but also the posterior combination is more marked uh but you can go the same a lobin hafer type posterior approach and a spring plate this time because of the wider plate i use at the plate of the one third tubular nature and then sprung it under the posterior medial plate and the standard uh, anterolateral plate for reduction now it's not always uh, that easy that you can decide that whether you need a posterior medial plate or a standard direct medial plate for example this fracture on the medial side has double apex so there's a posterior medial apex which is uh, which requires a buttress but there is also an anteromedial apex and uh, all apexes will need buttressing because otherwise that's where the loading point of failure will come so this required both posterior medial as well as a uh, direct medial plate and then a lateral plate uh, for reducing the lateral joint line uh, the more type 2 these are um, uncommon fractures the usually varus extension type of injuries and then you will see this varus compression as well as uh, uh, loss of anterior slope of the tibial plateau and these look very innocuous but these other uh, if if left non operative these can deteriorate really fast because a uh, varus tibia is inherently unstable um and i see these like an hdo problem so i i i use to the the hdo tomofix sprites to fix this uh this is from a different comma i think smith and nephew or something but you can you can see how it's an antero medial application of the plate like an high tibial osteotomy and that buttresses the fracture back down and reduces it and you can see that the fracture is not this plate is medial but it's antero medial it's not on the medial side uh, direct, direct medial shin is not uh, posterior either this is a different case where uh, the tomofix uh, hdo osteotomy plate has been used for exactly the same purpose and uh, as you can see a lot of time these fractures have an associated posterolateral corner injury uh, this one was very minor but there have been cases where i would have i had to do a medial correction of plate as well as the posterolateral corner repair at the same time um changing the game up when the metaphyseal dissociation as well as articular depression come together you can use the metaphyseal medial corner for articular elevation and uh, fixation but as you can see on that lateral view the tibial tuberosity fragment is a trapezoid it's free floating so if you fix the medial and lateral column the tuberosity fragments going to have a risk of secondary displacement by the big tendon or mechanism pulling at it so apart from the joint elevation and column fixation it also required a direct tibial tuberosity stabilization and uh, i i like to reference over a plate because tibial tuberosity is a massively strong pull and putting a screw across the front to back is uh, and often you know you, you don't even know at the back cortex whether whether you're going to get decent bone or into fall into comminution so I, i like to use a plate as a spring over or a tension band over the tibial tuberosity um this guy had all the challenges you can uh, the the primary x-ray doesn't look 
doesn't show all the problems to you. But once you put that into a spanning X-fix and get that to length and get a CT scan, it starts to reveal all these troubles. The tubular tuberosity fragment is unstable. Thankfully, uh, the patient's sadness has been delivered out of the fracture at the close reduction, but it's, it's very much a risk of uh, um, uh, blocking accurate reduction. But the lateral combination is quite amazing. And uh, more more in, impressively is the posterolateral coronal combination, which is quite difficult to get to, and the articular surface is all sort of sunk into the fibula. As uh, you will see in a second, a is that the articular surface is 90 degrees turned looking forward and locked under the fibula. So there is no way that if you just go directly through your girdies or steatomy or girdies fracture line, uh, you can reduce this accurately or you can have any sort of control over it. So for that patient, apart from your Lobenhofer for the medial side, uh, I also needed a direct posterolateral approach just behind the fibula. Uh, thankfully, when the fracture is displayed, the fracture has done all the internal dissection for you, and as long as you be respectful to the skin and uh, identify this, uh, the peroneal nerve and don't mess with that, it's actually a fairly safe approach. So we went to the back first, had a medial referencing with a one-third tubular, a posteromedial medial buttress to push everything forward, and that T-plate to contain that postural lateral combination. And as you can see, when, uh, when I'm pushing everything from the back, the slope is reversed, the TBI is sort of spilling over forward. But that's okay, that's intentional. As soon as, soon as the joint line is uh, relatively restored, and then turn them over, and then it needs the standard anterolateral plate, but also the tibial tuberosity uh, needs to be fixed. So this, this has been my personal record of five plates in a tibial plateau. Uh, but if you do this right with soft tissue respect and the right biomechanics, that's not uh, what we call a dead bone sandwich. Um, and that's the patient with uh, all those uh, scars well healed at uh, about four months. Yes, So, uh, the, no, um, I would, final message I would say is consider the mechanism of injury because that's where you will find your clues for how to reduce and fix. Use the 3D CT scan to your benefit for understanding. Use the approaches only as the fractures dictate. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would never, never go your, your uh, right angle incision because the patient's going to need a knee replacement in the future and so on. Because if you start with that intention, you already have accepted defeat. And if you do a bad approach, an inadequate approach that you struggle with reduction and fixation, that means you're going to struggle with the actual outcome. And then that patient's less likely to get the best, uh, best results. So I would rather take care and make the approaches required to give the patient best chance at reconstruction. Uh, don't be afraid to change position. Uh, very easy to go prone. For me, I quite routinely for all my posterior, posteromedial approaches go prone because trying to go supine and turning around the leg, you struggle with yourself. You, you, you please your anesthetist, but uh, you add a lot of stress uh, to you. And once you start doing some posteromedials in prone position, you will not go back. All right, that's the end of it. Thank you.